Um, I was telling telling Perry a while ago uh, everything that he just mentioned. You cannot you cannot uh, um, restate enough uh, the importance of soil fertility. None of the things that we're trying to do make any sense if we're not managing any soil fertility. And I, I may kind of get off into the weeds a little bit, but if you think about how you're sitting in the chair that you're sitting in, aside from the grace of God, your body is made up of nutrients that come from the soil. And if we're not managing our soils, if we're not managing our crops, the crops that we feed our animals, they're not gonna have the nutrition to carry about their metabolic processes and then when you harvest them and consume them for yourselves, you're not going to have the nutrients. And so managing soil fertility is extremely important. I, I, I commended him on his, his talk. I don't see him in here, but he, he did an excellent job, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to go behind him. Um, like Logan, or, uh, Lakin mentioned, my name is Brett Rushing. I'm at the Coastal Plant Experiment Station in Newton. Um, and like Perry mentioned, I, I too have made uh, my share of mistakes in Baylage. Um, and so I, I consider that my job to, to make all the mistakes and to tell you what not to do. Hopefully that, uh, that you'll have a little bit better success than I have. And I'll, I'll show you some of those pictures and some of those pitfalls to kind of keep, keep aware of. Um, but for this presentation, I, I've kind of made a few uh, typos already. And so the presentation that you see up here on the screen may not be exactly what you have on your handouts, but I'll, I'll try to work through it. Um, and... Uh, and it's a really informal deal. If you've got questions, feel free to just holler them out um, and we'll kind of work through it. Um, but for the rest of the, the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about um, what baleage production is, how we go about making baleage. Uh, we'll kind of go through some frequently asked questions. Uh, some of you may be new to it. Some of you may be doing it longer than I've been alive. Um, so we'll just kind of walk through some of those questions. And then at the end, um, we'll talk about some baleage economics, and I'm not a, I'm not an economist, um, but uh, but like I've, I've told folks in the past, my dad is an accountant, um, and so I had to account for every cent that was spent on our my mom and daddy's place, and so when it comes to making baleage, uh, there's a dollar and cent to it. A lot of the soil fertility stuff that Perry talked about, uh, nitrogen is high, potash is even higher. It doesn't look like it's coming down anytime in the future, so. Uh, we'll try to work through some of those costs um, in just a few minutes. All right. So what, what exactly is baleage? And I, the best way that I've been able to, uh, to describe it is baleage is essentially pickling grass or pickling uh, whatever type forage crop that we're trying to feed. Um, uh, it's, it's considered a high moisture forage. We try to shoot between 50 and 50, 55% moisture. Uh, when we're actually wrapping and so just I mean just a kind of Q&A here So when we when we harvest dry hay uh, What are we trying to get the moisture down to? 12% 12. 12%, okay, all right, so how how long does that take us to be able to do that? So by the time we harvest and by the time we wrap typically in the summertime How many how many hours or how many days does it take us to get to that 15% 12%? Three to four days, depending on our yield. Okay, all right, so baleage is a very quick process. Typically, uh, the day that we're laying it down, depending on the crop, depending on environmental conditions, we can be baling that afternoon or potentially the next day, depending on what uh, several, several of those factors. Um, but it's a high moisture forage. It's not the, not the dry hay that we're looking at. We're trying to bale between that 50 and 55% moisture. And so what happens is when we actually wrap those bales with plastic, we're excluding oxygen, okay? So microbes that are in that forage, as soon as you harvest it, they begin breaking down the nutrients that are in that forage for their, for their own consumption. And so what we're wanting to do is limit the capacity for those microbes to be able to break down that forage, all right? So if you think about your gut, you think about the rumen, uh, the pH in the, in, the, in the gut of a cow, all right, we want to maintain that pH so that those microbes are breaking that forage down in order to digest those, those nutrients. Well, in the pickling stage, what we're doing in baleage, we're wanting to limit that. And so when we wrap it, we're reducing the pH in that bale that restricts the capacity for those microbes to break it down. And so we're preserving it. We're pickling that grass to be able to feed it at a, at a, at a later date. Um, 
there's different types of how, uh, different uh, mechanization processes of how we'll actually do that wrapping. Uh, we'll get into this in a little bit, but you've got inline wrapping, uh, inline wrappers, tube wrappers. Uh, you've got single bell wrapping where we're actually uh, wrapping an individual bell, moving that bell to a, another location and then uh, transporting it and feeding it individually. Um, but typically it takes about 35 days to get that pH low enough to restrict microbial uh, fermentation of that, of that bale, or not fermentation, but degradation of that bale. So by the, day, by the time you harvest it and get it baled, 35 days, hopefully depending on the environmental conditions, how many times you wrap it, how tight of a wrap you've got, 35 days is kind of that, that window right there in terms of when we can start to feed it and when, when the microbes have shut down. Um, most folks think that, well, if I've got it wrapped, uh, that it'll live on, in, in, you know, uh, uh, you know for, forever. Um, but really, we can only feed this baleage for about 12 months uh, before it begins to, to mold and accumulate bacterial growth. And so that, just think of it as a, a jar of pickles that you've got in, in, your, fr in your fridge. You, before you open that seal, it's sitting in your in your closet, uh, but once you break that seal, once you start feeding it, the shelf life on it drastically declines and you've got to start feeding it. Um, or else that oxygen is gonna get into those bells and start to degrade those bells and it's gonna lose its quality. So about 12 months, so typically when we put up baleage, we're gonna put up enough for us to feed or to sell or to get rid of within, within that year. Um, So, so typically that's the time you open it. All right, you've got 12 months. So if you've got a, an inline wrapper and you start feeding it on day one, typically we want you to feed that tube or that line within that 12 months. Now, um, I've heard of folks uh, trying to feed, uh, let's just say it's an annual ryegrass, they produce it, they put it up today, trying to feed it two years out. Uh, it, it has lost uh, some quality to it. Um, but tip, most of our guys are doing in line, and most of the time they can't wait, and so we try to get rid of it within a year. How much plastic required to put on this? We'll, we'll get into that. All right. Um, all right. Uh, so when we, when we think about costs that are associated with hay production, whether it's dry hay production, baleage production, any type of feeding that we do in our beef cattle operations, and I'm assuming most of us are beef cattle producers, uh, feeding whether it's uh, grazing, fertilizing our fields, uh, to putting up stored feed, going to the co-op, buying uh, commodity feeds, pellets, whatever, that constitutes over 50% of our costs. And so when, it, when we're considering baleage, uh, this, is a, a, this is a way for us to capture, like we talked about a while ago, for us to capture nutrients, uh, the highest quality nutrients that allows us to more efficiently meet the nutritional demand of the livestock that we're actually feeding it to. Uh, baleage is one of those, those technologies kind of allows us to do that. Um, one other reason we, we uh, see an advantage to baling or to, to baleage um, is it reduces the risk of field curing. I, you know, dry hay production is a crapshoot. We get into July and it's 30% chance of rain for 14 days. All right, and it's extremely difficult to put up dry hay uh, during the summertime. Baleage is one of those opportunities that allows us to get in and out of the field within you know, 72 hours potentially uh, or less and it allows us to put up that preserved hay and it kind of eliminates one of those environmental factors in putting up dry hay. Um, uh, reduces harvest and storage losses. Typically on dry hay, uh, so by the time you cut it, tet it, rake it, bale it and get it in the barn, typically we account for about a 20% loss in dry matter. All right, so think about all the times that you touch that bale from when you harvest it and get it to the feed bunk or the ring or whatever it is that you're feeding it. That's about a 20% loss of what you originally started off with. So that's 20% of your fertilizer, that's 20% of your labor, that's 20% of everything that's lost by, the, by the, the, the handling of that bell multiple times. Um, but with baleage, 
because you're wrapping it, because of that moisture, uh, you're, you're, it's a reduced handling, and because of that moisture being preserved in that bale, and because of the, the, the feed uh, consistency of that bale, they're gonna actually consume more of it. Typically, we only estimate about a 5% loss in dry matter with baleage. So you've got about a 15% difference in the harvest and forage losses, or uh, dry matter losses and storage losses from dry hay compared to uh, a high moisture hay. Um, retains uh, more nutritive value, all right? So that's, um, uh, Perry talked about this a while ago, um, and we'll kind of dive off into this in a minute. Uh, but when it comes to nutritional quality of the baleage, it's not going to get better. So there's the, there's the misconception. Uh, Perry had several misconceptions, and, and he addressed these. But the forage quality is not going to be enhanced through the process of baling. It's going to reduce the amount of decline. So as, as soon as you chop or as soon as you cut that standing grass, the quality is automatically going to decline. It's not going to get any better. The process of baleage doesn't increase the protein. It doesn't increase the digestibility of that product. The best quality that it's going to be is right before you cut it. All right. And so harvest maturity, the forage crop that you use, several of the things that Perry already talked about, that's where your nutritive value is. The process of baling is just simply maintaining and preserving that quality. Um, by having this higher quality forage or maintaining that preserved quality, that ultimately leads to reduced supplementation. All right, so essentially what we're trying to do is to meet the nutritional demands of the livestock that we're actually grazing or feeding all right, with what it is that we're feeding. If it's not being met by the quality of hay or baleage that we're putting up, you have to supplement. She's peak, uh, peak milk, she's got to, to feed that nursing calf, she's got uh, 25 pounds of dry matter she's got to consume per day. If the nutrients that are in that hay and feed that you're feeding her are not being met, you've got to supplement. Supplement's cheap, right? Anybody buying distiller's grains, soy holes right now? Anybody know the cost of those? All right, several hundred bucks a, a, a ton. All right, so that adds up. And so the process of baleage helps us reduce supplementation because we're, we're, we're putting up a, a higher quality product. All right, um, just a couple take home points on nutrition. Uh, baleage only preserves quality. It does not enhance it. We just went over that. But forage quality begins to decline as soon as forage is harvested. Junk in equals junk out. If we're not meeting the soil fertility needs, the crop nutrient needs, then baleage is not going to help you meet those nutritional demands of what it is that you're actually feeding, okay? Uh-oh. All right. Uh, this is a, uh, so at, at uh, the experiment station there in Newton, we've got about 35 to 40 acres of, of hybrid Bermuda grass, summer all Bermuda grass. Uh, and this is actually about a 10 acre field of uh, annual ryegrass that we would put up one year. Um, this was volunteer annual ryegrass. All right, so we did not plant that years and years and years. So uh, typically in our Bermuda grass hay fields, our first cutting has what? It's got a bunch of weed seed in. It's got a bunch of volunteer annual ryegrass and hen bit and buttercups, all our cool season weeds were in that seed bank. They grew up over the summertime. We didn't get out there and spray. Uh, we didn't kill all of our broadleaves. And so they've accumulated in that seed bank year after year. So our first cutting, essentially what we're doing is all that mature ryegrass we just sling seed out over the top of our Bermuda grass hay field. Well, over time, it ended up in being a solid stand of ryegrass for it. And I said, well, let's just try to put it up in baleage. So I fertilized that volunteer ryegrass and we put it up in baleage one year. And so what you'll, what you'll there's a couple of things I want you to notice in this picture. Any, any ideas, anything stick out to you? What's the, what's the sky look like? It's cloudy. Why does that matter? Moisture. Moisture. Drying process. All right. So guess, guess what mistake I made on this? I put it up too wet. We were pushing 70%. It was about 67, 70%. When we started unwrapping those bales, they were a soggy mess. All right. They didn't, form, they didn't uh, stay formed up in the wrap. They started like... Typically, when you put up high moisture bales, they'll basically just dissolve right there in front of you. They'll become just a, a wet, uh, just sloppy mess. I put it up too high. 
It wasn't a sunny day that day. I said, well, it rain's coming. Let's go ahead and get it in there, get it bailed, get it wrapped. I put it up too wet. What's another thing you noticed? What about the windrows? What did I use to cut that? All right, bar mower, disc mower. All right. Typically, I would recommend if you've got a conditioner, which I know our equipment guys here today, they'll talk about their different types of equipment. All I had is a disc mower. I've got a disc mower, just dry hay making equipment, uh, disc mower, rake, tenner. Um, when I laid this high moisture forge down, uh, in a windrow with a disc mower. I didn't tet it. I didn't spread it out. I just simply raked from that excessively wet windrow and then put that up. That's another issue that led to my, my moisture. I didn't spread it out. Your conditioners are going to beat it and whip it around uh, to be able to allow that, uh, that windrow to, uh, to dry out better, get you in the field a little bit sooner. But that's another mistake I, met, uh, I made. Um, Changing gears a little bit. Can you wrap, uh, wrap dry hay? Anybody ever wrap dry hay? Couple folks. Good, good experience. I get moisture mold on top. All right. He said he gets a little bit of moisture mold around. So I've, I've done the same exact thing. So a lot of folks say, well, I ain't got a hay barn. Uh, let me put up dry hay, and I'll just wrap my dry hay, and that kind of substitute for a barn. It keeps me from losing losing all that hay and getting, you know, 60 inches of rain on it a year. Um, it can be done. I've heard folks that have done it successfully, but you've got to have extremely dry bales. 12%, uh, I would say, at most on the moisture content. And so essentially what happens is you're, you've got to allow that bale, if you bale it at high moisture, you've, allow, you've got to allow it to go through that heat before you wrap it, or you've got to have it really dry uh, when you bale it uh, and before you wrap it. If not, that moisture is going to try to escape that bale by going to the exterior of that bale. And so when you start to cut it and unwrap it, the top three, four, five inches of that bale is just a soggy mush of dry hay uh, because you didn't get it dried enough before you put it in there. But I have seen where folks have gotten it down to 12% and have done a really good job at putting up dry hay uh, with an inline wrapper. Um, Question was uh, how many number of wraps? Uh, well, hang, hang on, let me, let me finish this. Um, uh, with, with dry hay, uh, sometimes we recommend black plastic if you can that kind of um, uh, prevents uh, or basically absorbs the heat, allows maybe that bale to, uh, to dry out a little bit better. Um, there's some research saying that, that black plastic might be a little bit more beneficial. Um, you reduce the number of wraps, so typically when we're putting up dry hay, uh, we would recommend putting up a fewer fewer wraps across that dry hay bale instead of as many as we recommend on on moist hay. Um, and then uh, there's another question down there at the bottom. It says user breathable film. I know there's some some companies out there now that have uh, a breathable wrap uh, that you can wrap these inline or even these individual bales with that basically allows uh, moisture out. Uh, it keeps moisture out, but allows air to come in. So the bales can actually breathe and go through that heat, but you don't have to worry about the moisture coming into the bale. Uh, so that's an option, but you can, you can use that type of plastic on an inline wrapper. Um, all right, so what, what forage crops can I put up in baleage? Uh, cool season forage crops, you know, annual ryegrass, small grains, those are gonna be our, our main species, oats, uh, cereal rye. Uh, but you can also put up clovers. You can also put up alfalfa, white clovers, so perennial uh, legumes. Warm season species, uh, millets, uh, crabgrass. You can do your perennials like Bermuda grass and Bahia grass, and then sorghum sudan. Uh, oftentimes, uh, a lot of this has to do with equipment. Like Perry already mentioned, a lot of this has to do with fertility. Um, and then, again, deciding which of these forage crops has the capacity to meet the nutritional demands of what it is that you're actually feeding it to. Um, same field, I wanted to, I meant to change this picture, but it's just showing that I've got a caddy with a disc mower on the back mowing that same field. Um, so let's talk about inline versus individual. So uh, inline wrappers, uh, advantages, uh, typically they, they uh, wrap more bales per hour, requires less labor, and so when, when we say less labor, all right, so we're assuming that you have one man that's baling, 
uh, one man that's coming back into the field, getting that, that wrapped bale and then moving it to the wrapper and then he is controlling the, uh, the wrapper. Um, whereas an individual wrapper, uh, what we're saying is you've got one man bailing, but you've got a separate man, a separate piece of equipment uh, that's, use, that's coming back behind them and wrapping it and then a, potentially a third piece of equipment or that baler coming back into the field and moving that wrapped bale out of the field to wherever it'll be stored. There's tons of different variables in that, but traditionally we will say that there's less labor involved in inline versus an individual. A lot of the inline wrappers are automated. You just place the bale in there, he's going back out to the field. As long as it's steering in the right direction, there's really, you don't have to have anybody there. Um, can use less plastic. Uh, Air exposure reduces the storage life. So what I mean by that is once you begin feeding those inline tubes, once you open that, that end bale and start feeding out of it, oxygen is going into that tube. And so that's, that's what we were talking about a while ago is the quality and the degradation of those, of those bales that are in that end line begin to degrade. All right, and so once you open the end of it, it's kind of like open that jar of pickles, the shelf life is now being reduced. And so you've got to start feeding it. Whereas with the the individual wrap bales, they're gonna stay there until you start to feed it. Um, higher purchase price with an inline, bear, uh, inline wrapper compared to an individual. Uh, another thing to consider is transportation. Uh, when you put holes in this plastic, uh, again, you're, you're allowing oxygen into those bales, promotes degradation, and so you've got to have the, the capacity to be able to pick these bales up without poking them and store them in a place to where you're not, you're not stabbing that plastic and opening them up and allowing for that degradation. Um, this is a, uh, we had a, a similar type field day in Newton several years ago. This is a, a Bermuda grass hay field um, where we were doing uh, individual wrap bales. And so you can see the conditioner right here in the middle of the field. You've got a, you've got a rake up there at the top. You've got a, uh, a baler right there and you've got uh, the individual wrapper right here. That's a lot of people, it's a lot of equipment. Um, we had rain coming in that afternoon. We had people that we wanted to show this to. This is typically not, uh, you know, this is not the, what you would typically expect uh, from, an in, or from an individual wrapper, all the people and all the pieces of equipment. Um, but it just goes to show you the steps in which it takes to get to that finished product of an individual bale. Uh, it's an inline wrapper for those of you who haven't seen it. This, this hay was the high moisture stuff that I messed up on from that original field. And it's, it's kind of hard to see in the picture, but that's a really dark green bell. They were almost oozing when I was wrapping it. And I, I just sat there saying, I'm, I'm messing up uh, while I'm doing it. But um, How long did you wait before you bailed and wrapped? That was the same day. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I had... I had 90% chance of rain that night. The wrapper was on loan. I just, there was, I can give you as many mistakes as you want to hear, but I just did it wrong. I take full, full blame for it. It wasn't even, it wasn't even a trial error. I knew going into it, I was doing wrong. Just, just the error. That's right. Um, Uh, so get the question of when, when do I harvest? So if we're doing clovers, uh, typically we recommend about 10% bloom. So if you, you know, you just go out there and look at it, you know, just kind of visually estimate 10, why, uh, anybody on why 10% bloom? Any idea? All right. So typically with legumes on, uh, and not, not like white clover, but, uh, some of your summer, I mean, your winter annuals, like, uh, Bersim and Berlanza clover, uh, maybe even crimson clover, if some of you do that. That 10% bloom is kind of the, the highest peak nutritional quality and highest peak yield. So about 10% is kind of that sweet spot of when you want to cut it. When it comes to grasses, um, typically we recommend at boot stage. So that's, that's kind of right when that seed head begins to emerge out of that flag leaf. So if you've got, if you've got a, you walk out of the field and there's nothing but seed heads, we would say that's probably past maturity in terms of the ideal time of when you want to cut it. Uh, and if it's too early, uh, typically our, a lot of our forages are higher in moisture, they're higher in digestibility, higher in dissolvable uh, carbohydrates, uh, but it's, it's harder to get those um, 
uh, down to that moisture that we want for baleage. But on the inverse side, if it's too mature, if it's over mature, uh, we've got higher lignin concentrations, less dissolvable carbohydrates. It won't ferment, uh, it won't ferment as well. Uh, it results in lower digestibility. A lot of times it's real stemmy. A lot of those stems will poke through that plastic, which is a problem. Um, and so you, it's, it's all about that sweet spot, uh, matching the sweet spot with environmental conditions. All right, so this is, uh, this is annual ryegrass that we're putting out in baleage. I would say we might be a couple days behind. You can see seed heads, probably maybe 10 to 15% of seed heads out in there, but this is, this is a pretty good window. Um, but this was also that day I made, made mistakes. Um, what is this? Anybody know what that is? That's alfalfa. We put up, we had, I was telling John a while ago, we had, uh, we had a three year stand of alfalfa. We actually interseeded a Roundup Ready alfalfa into hybrid Bermuda grass and we put it up in baleage. I mean, it was, now that we did, we did well. Um, uh, so we, we planted alfalfa in the fall of, I think it was the fall of 15. And so we had, we put it up in baleage in 16, 17 and 18. Um, and we were, I mean, even by the third year when we were probably less than 50% stand, uh, we were still pushing 20% on crude protein on alfalfa and Bermuda grass. I mean, it was, it was some good stuff and we did it, did it well. Um, is it what now? Was it cost effective to raise it here in Mississippi? So the question was, was it cost effective to raise it in Mississippi? I would say it depends on who you're selling it to or what you're feeding. So if you've got yearlings or if you're in a horse hay market, there potentially is cost effective. Um, I, can't, I can't make that decision for you, but for us, uh, we were feeding it to mama cows. It was probably a little bit more than what they did. Um, but uh, I mean, there was zero supplementation required at all. But it will grow down here. Oh yeah, it will grow down here. Yeah. Yep. All right, so how much plastic, um, and this is uh, based off of manufacturer, uh, how tight those, uh, those wrappers are actually wrapping it, the type of plastic that you use, but typically you're seeing around four to six layers of plastic by the time, like if it's an inline wrapper, by the time it starts on the edge of the bell and it moves all the way across the bell about four to six times of wrap across the across the bale. Um, we recommend using a, a UV stabilized that, you know, as those bales are sitting out in the field, the light is trying to degrade that plastic. And so we're wanting to use a, a UV stabilized pre-stretched plastic. Y'all seen the wrappers. If they're not, if it's not a pre-stretched plastic, I don't even know if you can buy plastic that's not pre-stretched, but you can imagine uh, it's kind of like a rubber band. It just gets longer and longer and longer. You want the pre-stretch stuff so that when you wrap it, it's a good, tight, solid bale. Um, too, little, too little on the wrap uh, can result in oxygen penetrating that bale, even though it's, uh, it can potentially prevent it. You've got to imagine those seams of that plastic going across, oxygen being able to go through those seams if you don't have enough of those seams going over the bale, which can lead to spoilage. All right, so what if I feed a molded bale? Uh, white mold is a, is a regular occurrence when we're putting up baleage. Um, sometimes it's in there due to the, the, um, the fermentation process and the bacteria, the microbes that are in there. Uh, but tip, if we feed, you know, people say, well, I can't feed it, it's got that white mold on there. Most of the time they're gonna refuse it. It's got an off taste. I would assume it's an off taste, uh, an off uh, uh, smell and flavor. Um, and they'll typically, you know, pull it off or eat around it. Um, typically no significant harm if it's ingested. Now botulism, on the other hand, can happen uh, when you put it up too wet. Uh, so basically the moisture of that bale is too high, the pH never gets too uh, low enough to kill that, that, those microbes, uh, and then it can lead to botulism. Another, and we, we've actually done this, uh, we have wrapped up snakes and squirrels and all kinds of stuff in those bales and you're pickling a squirrel or pickling a rat or pickling a snake in that bale, and that can lead to botulism as well. So it's, that's just a, a nature of the beast. Um, but also preventing uh, puncture damage. That's, that's the main thing, excluding oxygen and putting it up at the right moisture. 
All right, so how soon can I feed it? Uh, feed it? Um, you know, so I mentioned 35 days uh, when that fermentation process has kind of done its thing. Uh, um, if done correctly, you're, you've got about six to eight weeks, and that's a little bit uh, longer window. Uh, you can reach a stable pH in about four weeks, and that's dependent on the crop, the moisture, how tight it's bailed, environmental conditions, uh, where, where you're actually doing the wrapping. Um, and again, feed values maintained for about 12 months, just as long as you know, you've, you've maintained that good shape and got it the right moisture. Moisture, moisture, moisture. All right, um, now I'm gonna get into something that I'm a little uncomfortable in talking about, which is economics. Uh, and I, I was sitting over here a while ago kind of looking through my slides and I've already noticed that I made a couple of mistakes. Uh, so the theme of today's talk is bail at the right moisture and I've made mistakes. Um, so feel, feel free to, to jot these new numbers down as I go through them. But essentially what I wanna tell you to, what I did is if you go to Ag Econ uh, website at Mississippi State, they have enterprise budgets for every crop uh, that's produced. We have a forage enterprise uh, spreadsheet that we actually can uh, derive or that I've actually used to come up with all the numbers that we've talked about today. Um, the, I tell folks the, the main thing that I like about it is it has an appendices in the very back that has all the state average prices on commodities uh, feeds, fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, uh, equipment cost, depreciation. There's no figure into it. You just go in there and find out which one you want it. You add up this piece of equipment. I use this piece of equipment. I add it up and this is how much it costs me on a per acre basis. It really simple, really easy to use. I can use it. Um, the second reference that I want you to, to consider uh, is if you go to LSU's website, uh, Dr. Kurt Lacey who's actually with Mississippi State now helped develop a, uh, uh, an extension publication that's called Economics of Bailage for Beef Cattle Operations. And so the next several slides, what I have done is I've taken his publication and I've used our numbers and I put them together. Um, and again, I've made a couple mistakes, but that's, so when you, when you go home and you're trying to justify to your wife why you're buying this new inline wrapper, go to these websites, use that, those numbers and say, well, I can make money, honey. And this is, this is how you figure that out. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. I'm going to make sure I get to the ones I, I saw my mistakes in. All right. Um, so just to start off, this is how I, and I, I've got about five or six of these slides. They're all printed off, so if you can't see the numbers, look on your handouts. I think all the data numbers are accurate, but I, I kind of stepped out of the box and made an application, and that's where I, I messed up. So basically, my math is wrong. Their math is right. Um, but what I did is I took the purchase price of a conventional baler, a high-moisture round baler, an inline wrapper, and an individual wrapper, and I could be off on these, these are just kind of getting online, going to auctions, looking at what people are asking and buying for. Um, these are kind of some average prices of these types of balers, uh, these types of wrappers. Um, I'm sure the equipment guys, they, you know, ask them, they've got the, the right numbers, but I'm trying to walk you through how I make these calculations. So for the balers, we, we have an eight year useful life, 15 years on your, your wrappers, 200 hour use on your on your balers, 4896. You, you see how I work through all this. But essentially, when you account for the life of that piece of equipment, uh, the interest rates, you can see your annual loan payment down here on the bottom for each of those pieces of equipment. That's seven and a quarter percent interest. Um, I know some of you are paying cash and you don't have to worry about this kind of stuff. Um, but this is this is for uh, this is trying to account for uh, for everything. Um, so when we get to the end and we talk about how much of this high quality baleage I have to do to break even, these numbers on the bottom right here are the numbers that I'm trying to get to. All right, so this is the estimated per bale acre cost for conventional and high moisture balers. And so what I'm doing is I'm comparing a conventional round. So we're assuming we're making dry hay with a conventional round versus a high moisture 
like a silage baler um, there on the right. And you can see the cost differences between the two. So for instance, I've got the same tractor pulling both. I've got the same uh, labor pulling both. Uh, but you see the repair and maintenance. You've got a few dollars difference there because you're a little bit more expensive of a machine, different additions, different options. You start to see the difference as you work down the list. Um, there's your total indirect cost, excuse me, uh, per hour uh, tractor cost, your baler indirect cost right there. Um, then you start adding it all up. And so basically when you get down to the bottom, uh, you're looking at about $3.68 per bale. And so when I say a bale for the dry hay, that's a 1,200 pound bale at 15% moisture at 3.6 tons per acre of yield. And so that's that cost. But now on the, on the baleage side, that's a 2,000 pound bale because it's higher in moisture. It's a high moisture baler at 50% moisture, but the same yield. And so that's why you have basically a twice the cost because you've got more biomass um, or more moisture, you're hauling water around. And then I've got it broken down on dry matter. So keep, so basically each of these slides, the bottom line is the one I want you to look at and we'll add up all those bottom lines at the, at the end. All right, this is, uh, this is estimated per bale as fed. So everybody's familiar with as fed and dry matter, right? I don't have to explain that. We're all operating in the as fed, but we make comparisons on the dry matter. So I'm, I'm, for today's purposes, I'm just talking about as fed because that's, that's what it is that we're moving and handling and, and comparing. Um, so this is uh, an inline wrapper, the cost uh, per, per bale on an inline wrapper and the cost per bale on an individual wrapper. And again, the equipment guys, if y'all are in here and you say that's wrong, then tell me and we'll work it out. Um, but I've got, uh, so in the top line, you've got tractor operating cost. And so if you look down here to my assumptions, all right, so for an inline wrapper, you've got one tractor, two wheel drive tractor, 105 horse, purchase price of $74,000. That's how much diesel costs, 448, uh, which is high. Uh, that's kind of a, an on-road type price, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the worst picture that I can. Um, uh, but you've got one tractor operating that inline wrapper, whereas an individual, not only do you have the baler and the wrapper, um, excuse me, the baler, uh, the tractor and the baler, but you've got a separate uh, tractor, two wheel drive, 75 horse tractor that's coming back behind it and wrapping those bales individually. So that's why you get a higher individual cost compared to the inline. You've got more labor. So this, I'm assuming you've got one guy that's doing all this. On this one, you've got two guys doing it. Um, Less maintenance, it's a smaller piece of equipment. Uh, I don't know how many bales they project in terms of its useful life, but you've got uh, cheaper repair and maintenance. Uh, you've got plastic cost. You, typically you're gonna have more plastic in your individuals because you're going around the ends of the bale and the sides, not just uh, uh, the sides when you're on the inline wrapper. Gas cost, you know, you've got, I think it's like a 13 horse Honda on some of these models, um, but you've got to account for the gasoline that it's taken for that inline wrapper to, to wrap it. You don't have that in individual. Um, you start adding all that up at the end. Uh, I'm looking at about $16.42 uh, per bale as fed with an inline wrapper, $17 with an individual wrapper. And so this, this number is, uh, this 727 right here from the previous slide for high moisture round baler, that's 720, oh goodness. Stay with me. All right, that 727 is added to this total wrapping cost. So I take the tractor and the baler and then I add it to the inline wrapper and that's where this 1642 and that 1716 comes from. Smell what I'm stepping in? All right. All right, so let's move on. Estimated cost per acre. So now, now, so this is, this is just the harvest of the crop and getting it wrapped. This hadn't talked anything about what Perry talked about. All right. 
this is this is from the crop to the edge of the field of where you've got it stored. This this did not account for anything up to harvest. And Perry should be quick to point out that I ain't got enough fertilizer on there. Uh, I <laughs> I put these numbers based in there what I think y'all might be doing and what I know I would be doing, uh, which is not meeting fertility needs. Uh, and so basically this number down here at the bottom is shy of what it should be. All right, so what I did is I estimated a cost on a per acre of annual ryegrass. So from the slides on out, I'm just talking about annual ryegrass. I'm not talking about putting up Bermuda grass in baleage. I'm not talking about a warm season annual. All the numbers are for annual ryegrass from here on out, all right? So I've got fertilizer. I've got uh, basically uh, 100 units of nitrogen of, of urea. Uh, these are 2023 numbers. And so that was basically 40 bucks per hundred weight, uh, 2.17, uh, or basically 217 pounds of urea to get my 100 pounds of nitrogen, $86. I sprayed it. I got rid of my, my state wildflower, which is buttercup. I sprayed that. Um, I've got my seed cost. I've got my uh, spreader cost. You know, it costs money for that guy to run out there and actually spread that fertilizer, spread that, uh, that herbicide. I've got a disc, a single app. I run through that field with a disc. I come back and I cultivate it smooth it out, uh, then I run my grain drill over the top, and this is a per acre cost, $173. Uh, but again, and this is based off of fuel, this has labor, uh, depreciation, repair and maintenance, the whole nine yards, except for the additional fertility that Perry recommended, $175 an acre. All right, well then how, do I, how much yield do I, can I expect on a per acre basis? Again, going back to Perry's comments, uh, but we have state variety trials. Did y'all know that there is a variety trial at the McNeil station right down the road? All right, so let me ask you this. Why do you buy the variety of ryegrass that you buy? Because why? It's proven. it's proven from where? From here, locally. Okay, all right, good. What would you say? Performance. performance. How, do, how do we know it's performance? Because the seed man says so, my co-op says so. Where do they get their information? They have their trials. We have forage variety testing program where we have about 40 entries a year that we, we evaluate annual ryegrass varieties. And one of those locations is at McNeil. And so what I did is I went to last year's variety testing bulletin and I got the average yields from the top, uh, let's see, I got the top four I think varieties at McNeil. So your top was Ranahan, you had Prime, uh, Prime, Grits, Big Balls, Tetrapoids, Diploids. You've got Marshall, Jackson, Nelson, uh, Lone Star. And basically this is just showing you the total dry matter yield that you can expect from these, these varieties. There were 37 entries last year. So across those 37 entries, the average dry matter yield was about 4.3 dry matter tons at 15% moisture. And so what I'm doing is I'm assuming that we're making this into dry hay. But we're not making dry hay, we're making wet hay. And so I increased our yield based off of that moisture, and that's about five tons per acre, all right? But the way that we harvest these plots is we cut them four times, and we fertilize them with 100 units. How many times are we going to cut baleage, typically, from the same field? Once, maybe twice. That's right, all right? And so what I did is I basically assumed a 70% yield of our total maximum yield that we would get off of four cuttings. And so that 70% is around 7,300 pounds, uh, which is about 3.6 bales of those 2,000 2, pound bales. So that's 3.6 bales. So if you look at your handouts and you see it's based off of a certain yield, that's where that 3.6 comes from. That's how I figured that up. And so you've got to be able to figure out your dry matter yield. And as we go through these slides, You'll see why that's important. All right. Um, all right, so we've talked about the wrapping process. We've talked about the planting process. But what about the harvesting process? That's something else we hadn't talked about. So these are my costs. This is what, that, what I've done. All right, so I used a disc mower, uh, eight-foot 
uh, mower, two-wheel drive, 75 horsepower tractor per acre per bale. I used a rake. I've used what they consider a, a hay mover, so I've got to get that bale from the field to where I'm going to wrap it. I've got a high moisture baler we've already talked about. I've already got my wrapping costs from the previous, uh, the previous slides. I've got my crop establishment from my previous slides, and then I've got my total. So that's $260.13 done per acre. And then when you divide that out on a, that 3.6 bales per acre, that 2,000 pounds based on annual ryegrass, you're looking at $72.25 in the wrapper. What do y'all think? Too high? Not high enough. My wife tells me all the time I'm good at accepting criticism. Now's your time. <laughs> Is it right? Who can afford that and raise that? That's a great question. So the question was, and I'll repeat it for you didn't hear you, who can raise that and afford to feed cows? That's a great question. It's called another full-time job. Yep. But see, but I'm, now hang with me. I'm not saying you, you can't do it. We're going to figure out a way to pay for this. I'm telling, I'm telling my wife, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you how I can pay for it. All right? Um, how, how much is a dry hay bale worth? So. That's seven, that, that is $72 for a 2,000 pound, 50% moisture bale. Yep. Yep. All right. Protein, you're probably, all right, so that's, that's going to come into that. So people will say, well, that, that $72, that tells me nothing about quality. So let's, let's take this number and go a step further. All right. So this is, this is the slide that I messed up on. All right. Or, an, excuse me, another slide that I messed, on, messed up on. <laughs> All right, so what I did is I assumed we've got uh, a herd of 1,200-pound cows. They're two months postpartum. She's going to consume about 2% of body weight uh, per day, and we're going to feed her for 150 days. All right, when you multiply, that's basically about 24 pounds of dry matter a day. You multiply that times 150, that's 3,600 pounds of dry matter, not 3.6 tons. 3,600, that's, that's a big, big uh, uh, mathematical error there. And so when you, when you put 3,600 pounds over a 150 day feeding period, that brings that cost down to $130 per cow over 150 day, not 260, 130, which brings that cost per day down to 86 cents per head per day. All right, so $130 a cow, 86 cents a head. And then uh, let's just say I've got 50 head. Well, you just take that and multiply it times 50. So that means you've got, uh, it cost me $43 per day, $43.35 per day to feed that 50 head. And then $6,500 for a 150 day period. And we're assuming that we're meeting all her nutritional demands because we made such high quality baleage and we're not feeding anything else. It's just baleage. And so everybody got those numbers. If you didn't get them, holler at me later and I'll, I'll get them to you. But those, these are wrong. Don't look at those. All right. So now, now let's start figuring out how, and that was just kind of a, a real world scenario. And so now we're going to start figuring out how we're going to pay for this. All right. So what I did is I took the numbers that we've already got, except for that last slide, and I start trying to figure out, well, you know, we're going to reduce our storage loss because remember I told you about 20% loss in a dry bale versus only 5% loss in a, a baleage bale, high moisture bale. So that's about a 20 or 15% difference in storage loss. All right. And so what I did is I took the number of bales that we're producing based off of the yield that we've already calculated, and I figured out a 15% increase or a 15% reduction in storage loss. Does that make sense? And so basically, this is, how, this is how much money, this is how much savings due to reduced hay loss. So after 1,000 bales that we've put up, 
after that 15% difference in a dry hay versus a high moisture hay, a thousand bales, we've saved $18,000. All right. That's a thousand two. That's a yep. Same thing. We're we're putting two thousand pound bale. A two thousand pound bale. It's going to take me about a thousand bales before I can. I mean, I mean, you can see how many bales. So basically, you know, there's sixteen hundred bucks difference or a, a savings because we're not we don't have as much uh, storage loss. All right. So take that number and so this remember this is how much it's going to cost us to buy that inline wrapper. This is our annual loan payment, $9,300.72. All right, so you, you subtract those, and then this is the increase in operation. So basically, uh, about 540 bales is where we make that annual loan payment. I've got to put up 500 some odd bales to get out of the red into the black, or into the parentheses. Start selling some of it, or y'all go in together and buy one and wrap a bunch of hay with it. Um, anything on that? All right, one or two more slides, hang with me. All right, so now, now what I'm doing is I'm calculating on a, uh, I'm feeding it, all right? So I, it's not just, getting it to where it is, I've got to account for the quality that it has uh, and the animals that are consuming it. So I've got to figure out their, their nutritional demand and then meet that with the baleage. And if I can't meet it with the baleage, then I've got to have a supplement. All right, so what I did is I compared a dry hay, like a Bermuda grass hay, with an annual ryegrass baleage. And so uh, Bermuda grass hay, three to four cuttings a year. Most of us, some of us only cut it once. That's a different argument. Um, Dry matter per ton, uh, a ton per acre, that's a little low on Bermuda grass, uh, but I'm just saying about four tons per acre. Uh, annual ryegrass, uh, based off of the yield that we've got, three tons per acre, 6,000 pounds. Um, uh, quality, 12% crude protein on your Bermuda grass hay, which is good. It meets her nutrition. If she's milking, that's, gonna, that's, that's right there at that sweet spot. Baleage on annual ryegrass, we're at 20%. There's a lot of excess, uh, but there's reduced need for supplementation. TDN, 56%. These, again, these numbers are based off of our variety testing program, so these aren't just something that I'm coming up with. This is, these are numbers. Um, so then I've got a cost per acre. So that's all the harvesting and baling of dry hay multiplied times four on a per acre basis. And then this is that $260 number that we talked about a while ago. Divide it by dry matter, dry matter, and then I've got a ration on the bottom. So this ration, all right, is based off a thousand pound cow. She's milk, uh, peak milk, 22 pounds of uh, as fed hay per day at that quality. And so based off of that quality, we're going to feed her 50-50 uh, corn gluten soy hole mix at about 6.8 pounds. I got the numbers from uh, the USDA as of last week. That's $405 per ton based off of that 50-50. And so that dollar right there is hay plus the supplement, total ration. If you look at uh, the annual ryegrass baleage, the same thing, but because we're higher in quality, it's about 37 cents cheaper because even though we're feeding more of it, because it's got more moisture in it, we're feeding less supplement because we're meeting her nutritional demands and so that's only two dollars and seventy cents per head per day all right so 37 cents got it last slide all right so that 37 cents is right here that's where we start that's how we figure out all the rest of these numbers so what i did right here is this is the number of days required and the dollars per day savings required to make that loan payment all right, and so this is the herd size. So this is how many cows we've got in a herd. Cows, not yearlings, not steers, whatever. This is cows. All right, and so the first column right here, that's the number of days to break even based off of improved forage quality. So that 37 cents of higher quality forage 
is what is used to calculate this number. So based off of 25 cows and the amount of dry matter that they're gonna consume, at that rate, that 37 cents, we've got to feed baleage for 735 days to capture that increase in quality to make that loan payment, that annual. How many days are in a year? We're over that. It takes us more than a year to pay for that. Um, based off of that, but there, there's the variable, the increase in quality. If I, do, if I don't produce a higher quality product, it ain't gonna pay for itself. All right, uh, next column. This is the dollar per day difference to break even with 150 day period, all right? So what this does right here, this doesn't account for, we're only gonna feed them 150 days, the rest of the year we're gonna put them out to pasture and move them around, all that sort of stuff. This is, I've, I've got a 150 day feeding season, I've got to make it within that 150 days. We shouldn't be feeding 150 days, that's my opinion, but we'll just use that number. All right, so if we ain't got but 25 cows, we have got to account for a $1.81 difference per day to be able to make that over 150 day period to be able to make, make that annual loan payment. You get down here to 500 head, if you got 500 head and you're only feeding them for 150 days, it only takes you about a nine cent difference to be able to make that loan payment. All right, so now we've got increased quality. We've got this 150 day period. And so the final uh, kind of estimate right here. So this is the total feeding days to break even at 37 cents plus the savings of the reduced loss that we have in the baleage. So this is, this is accounting for everything right here. So basically, uh, if we have 150 days, you need about 125 head feeding 150 days to be able to make that loan payment, to break even. 125 head, you know, you're above that 150 day. This, this is the number of days that we've got to feed. We're only gonna feed it for 150 days. I mean, this is, this is for you to take home and to call me next week and say, you're wrong. Um, but this is, this is how I, this is how I figured it, I, you know. Um, but hey, if you got 500 head, it only takes you a month. And I paid for it. I told you we was gonna make money. Yeah, prices are up for everything. Um, all right, so in summary, again, these the numbers that I used are based off of annual ryegrass. So if you, if you say, well, heck, I ain't going to put up but 100 bales of ryegrass, but I do have Bermuda grass that I can put up, or I do have my neighbor's, you know, millet that we can put up. You know, if the numbers were just for annual ryegrass. You can, you may be able to pay for it a lot easier if you, you know, you add some diversity to the crops that you're actually putting up or figuring out how to, how to get paid for. Baleage can reduce loss and increase forage nutrient values ultimately leading in, in reduce, this, I mean, we didn't spend much time on this, but this is the, ultimately the reason why we're doing this. We can't put up good dry hay because it rains too much and we don't have as good a forage quality on the crops that we're putting up. Annual ryegrass and baleage allows me to put up a higher quality product reducing supplementation. And then know the cost and nutritional requirements. What am I feeding this to? What does she need or what does that yearling need or what is that, you know, what do I have to do to be able to meet those needs, to put the most pounds on the scale, and then the most economically efficient way to get those nutrients into her or him. It's him and her, right? We're on that same page, him and her. Um, know your cost and nutritional requirements and, and put that together, all right? Any questions? Yes, sir. Yep, that's a great point. Everybody get that? About hog damage and the plastic? Great point. Yes, sir. How do you figure that baleage is comparable to or superior to and more economical than the traditional vertical concrete silos that we've been using 
Uh, I can't say it is. I don't have the cost on what it... I mean, I don't, I don't see many silos. I'm sure that's pretty expensive. So, I mean, all you can do is just simply figure out the way to get it into that silo, how much it's going to cost, and make the comparison. Sounds great. Get a bulldozer and a mini X and get to work. Recycle it. You, you can recycle it. I agree. The cheapest way to put weight on your animal is to don't do any of that and let them go out there and stick their head down and graze it. That's my argument. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep. Yes, purchasing new. No. These. No, that. So those numbers are based off of equipment costs that are on the the ag econ so it's it's uh an initial like for instance on one of those it's a two-wheel drive 105 horsepower tractor with an initial price of seventy four thousand dollars so that's making the payments on that new tractor at seventy four thousand that that's in this cost this is not start starting from scratch this is we went to the dealership and we we bought it today or at that price you didn't have that based on 200 hours yes Yes, it's based off of hours. It's based off the useful life, repair, and maintenance, all, all the indirect, all that's in there. And using, that's right, using and labor. What's the difference in your weaning weights? Uh, difference in weaning weights? Uh, I mean, I think that's, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think that depends on the quality of baleage and how many days you're feeding it and genetics of what you're putting it in. I don't, I don't have any hard data that says you're going to get, you know, 30 pounds increase on Perry, you got any? Yeah.
Yep. And that's really, really hard to do with dry hay without a lot of supplementation. Anything else? Yes, sir. You know, they said the ryegrass is kind of like high moisture compound. Right. In a situation where you tested some moisture, do you wait another day before you bale it? Yeah, that, that's something that I didn't get into is how do you – how do you figure out the moisture content, you know, the, uh, the troubleshooting to figure out, yeah, it's time to bail or I need to wait till tomorrow or wait till this evening. There's several different ways you can measure moisture. Um, the way that I always recommend is just a microwave test. Uh, you know, go and grab a, 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 a sample of what it is that you're trying to, to wrap or to bail. Um, you can go in, take, if you've got a scale, weigh it, put it in a microwave, not your wife's fancy microwave, but the one out in your shop put it in there, put a little glass of water in there to keep it from overheating and microwave it down to where there's no percent change. And then you just take your wet weight, divide it by your dry weight, and that'll tell you your percent dry matter and percent moisture. That's the quickest way out, the most accurate way. Now they, they make moisture probes, they make moisture testers where you can take a 50 gallon bucket, slam it full of grass or crop, whatever it is. And then they've got these moisture probes where you can stick it down in there. I've seen about a 15 to 20% difference in just how tight you get that that bucket packed. Um, and if you're talking 15%, well then that means I'm, I'm at 50%, no weight, I'm at 65%. You know, and so it, that 15% difference makes a big difference when you're making that decision to wrap. And so I would, I don't know, I just use the microwave method. Yes, sir. Yep, so the question was on mower, uh, disc mower versus mower conditioner, and the equipment guys can speak to this more. Um, but your, your conditioners, depending on your crop, they can crush that stem. They've got the flail type where they can spread that, that windrow out, allow that air to move through the windrow, allow it to dry down better. Disc mower, I mean, you saw my pictures, it lays it flat and it stays right there, and it, that moisture just sits there. It doesn't, it doesn't have the chance to breathe, it doesn't have a chance to dry out. And so I would definitely recommend a, uh, either a disc mower with a rake, I mean not a rake, but a tether to be able to get it out and to fluff it up, um, or a mower conditioner, just a single pass to where it'll be able to get that air in between the canopy, crush the stems, and allow it to dry down a little bit faster. All right, thank you all for your time. Appreciate it.